Welcome to Delta Renaissance on the Road with Dr. Shadé Turnipseed. And today I'm talking with Senator David Jordan. And this is a repeat interview, but it's going to be more of a continuation of what we left off because for the Delta Renaissance talk show, we did a three-part series a few months ago. But now we're on Mississippi Valley State University's campus. And here is where David Jordan had the wonderful idea to create a historic site in tribute to B.B. King and all the other blues players and cotton pickers from the Mississippi Delta. And I'm going to really embrace this idea as well because it's part of what we're doing with the Cotton Pickers of America Monument Project in Mount Bayou. And we're also wanting to extend it here onto this campus. So your idea is just in perfect harmony with what we are attempting to do for the entire Delta and making sure that the historic significance of it is recognized not only in the Delta but throughout the state and in the country. Sure. So I want to welcome you to the show and again thank you for your brilliant idea to bring like a shotgun house onto this campus that would reflect the way cotton pickers, blues players and, and, and people of the Delta live for hundreds of years really. So, talk to us more well, about that. Well, idea. number one, Dr. Tennessee, it's good to be here on your show, and it's good to see Dr. Rue again and his young man. But uh, let me say this. This is our story. Long rows of cotton and scissors. He produced the blues. It's our, it's our story uh, uh, due to the fact of the uh, what we had to go through, our work. You'll find addiction may not be what it, it, it accurate in most of the records, but the person is telling a story. Mm -hmm. He either tells it in spiritual or he tells it in blues. Mm -hmm. That's why both of these two uh, uh, methods are original from black folks. Mm -hmm. and, but everybody else will take it in the holiday the blues and got other people trying to play the blues, but this is our story. Mm -hmm. And it's our story, and we should be the one to tell it. Absolutely. Because actually, it's it's us. Uh, it's our pain. Yeah. If you're working for a man, you go to work five o'clock in the morning. You track to drive or plier in a mule, two mules, or whatever you apply to feel. And the boss man come along uh, and curse you out and tell you call you the N word. And when you come home for lunch for one hour, or twelve to one. And you and your old lady have had a big fuss that morning. She has caught the Greyhound bus, flagged it down on the road, mm -hmm. and long. Mm -hmm. And you got to be back at work at 1 o'clock. You don't have anything but the blue. <laughs> That's enough. So then, these are just yeah. typical situations yeah. uh, that black folks live through. And it, it's just like anyone else heritage. Mm -hmm. This is ours. We made the Delta. We watered this land with our tears and made it richer with our bones. Wow. This is our story. But God has allowed us to succeed. Yeah. Yeah. I love and, that. And, uh, uh, you know, and it's not finished yet. Mm -hmm. The Bible is still right. You reap what you sow. Mm -hmm. So you can't get around that. Mm -hmm. So what you're seeing, you're seeing a people emerging, not to hate anyone else, mm -hmm. but to make Mississippi better. But you cannot go along with methods that uh, uh, the power structure have used over the years and gotten away with. A uh, little scenario where a Democrat was selling puppies, uh, three or four puppies, black and white puppies, beautiful puppies. The first day she charged a dollar puppy. And the next day she charged two dollars. So why are they two dollars? So the eyes are open now. So what you mean, our eyes are open now. We know too much and we see. Uh, what's what's going on? And we have had an African American, a colored person, a Negro, <laughs> to run this country mm -hmm. uh, for eight years, and he's done an excellent job, yeah. and still is yeah. one of us. Mm -hmm. And then, so you, you you can't treat us like you always have because it's the South. The South is America, right. and, and Mississippi is part of America. And that treatment is to treat us like we're stupid, or to treat us like... Well, whatever they've been sense. doing for the last 200, 300 years, mm -hmm. they used us as property uh, for 247 years of free labor. Mm -hmm. Then after that, the 100 
uh, 20 years of the worst kind of Jim Crow. And we have only been really emancipated uh, uh, freed since the civil rights movement. And then we run into problems and situations mm -hmm. that make us recall mm -hmm. how it used to be. And so we, we still got a lot of growing to go, but to, uh, it won't happen tomorrow by noon. Uh, but we're on our way. And we're going to be a success. But we are not, I, many people out of fear, you know, I, as a boy, I would do some things if it no more than taking somebody else's watermelon or robbing somebody's watermelon patch. And I thought when night came, my daddy came, I thought that person had told him something because I was guilty, my brother and I. So every time my dad would call me, I'd get nervous because yeah. I know something's supposed to happen to me because I've done something wrong. Mm -hmm. So you got a lot of people here out there nervous and, and say black people are violent because they're guilty of so much against black people. But we're not after anybody. Mm -hmm. Only thing we are trying to do is to make Mississippi better. But we aren't going to take what you laid on us for three centuries. We, that, that's over. You forget that idea. Yeah. There's no superior race. Hello. The, the God, God, you know, God made us how he wanted us to be. If I'm black, I'm God's baby too, mm -hmm. Jane Baldwin said. And, and if you got a problem with me being black, check with him. Don't bother me. I can't. Look, what what could I could what, what could we could do? God made me in this way. He sent me to the continent that uh, produced a darker skin. Mm -hmm. And you're going to bring me over here and I'll give him 200 my ancestors, 247 years of free labor, and then you're going to get mad with me because God made me black? What kind of idiot is that? Mm -hmm. I just said, well, you know, they're black folks, you know how they are. No, I don't. Yeah. So, so we have to realize that we're somebody. All right, good. Look at the Olympic a month ago. Who brought the most gold medals? <laughs> no, well, that's true. Who was the fastest man in the world? <laughs> somebody looked like one of us. <laughs> so so uh, we have to realize that we are a great people. Not taking anything away from anybody else, mm -hmm. but we have to learn to appreciate us. Absolutely, and I think it begins with the whole concept of know thyself. Yeah. When you know who you are, and you know whose you are, mm -hmm. can't nobody just run game on you and pretend like you're something else or less than. And I, that's the question that I really want you to reflect on, is what is it about African people that will tolerate this kind of abuse and, and subject? They have a slave, have slave mentality. Yeah. What? It was passed on uh, from generations yeah. saying, boy, don't you get into trouble. Number one, don't you make any white people wrong. If they uh, say something to you, just come on home and don't say nothing. And it, at this day and time, it's passed on. The worst thing you can do in changing individuals is try to change their mind psychologically, what they grew up with. So it was implanted in the Jim Crow laws. And so... Many blacks are still afraid. You'd be surprised at how much fear is still among us. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, that's the key word, too, is fear. And it's like it was for the white people who fear retaliation. It's also fearful of the violence that would be, I guess, you know, put on us for standing strong, well, taking well, a position. Well, we have seen so much. Every leader that we have produced, a significant leader, mm -hmm. they have killed. Right. And our, even not only our people, they have killed their own people who tried to work with us. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's why there's so much basic fear. But when you're born maladjusted like I am, you have to endure that and, and, and believe that it's uh, a better way. Because if you read God's word, God didn't make a mistake because he made me black. Like I said, I had nothing to do with it. Yeah. So, uh, coming out of his philosophy, a guy named Butterfield used to publish all Mississippi books. And what Butterfield said, I think I got the name right, that the black man's brain was smaller than the white man and that he couldn't look not as, in, as intelligent. 
Right. That was in books that were issued yeah. from the schools when I was in school. <laughs> and I've deliberately before. forgotten that guy's name. But I think it's Butterfield. It was, yeah, it's going to come in a second. But the yeah. thing is, is that, yeah, it was science. The yeah, was science. Around the uh, yeah, science. Philosophy. Yeah, science. Uh, and the study, when they know, uh, you know, I, I almost want to curse when I thought no, 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 think no. about it. Because it's like, you know, they know doggone well. You know, the, the reverse is true. And they know, to your point earlier, like at the Olympics, anything African people touch, embrace, and, 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 and really come to know, we take it to a whole other level. We become the best at it. Yeah. I don't care what it is. You well, know? we have sons and daughters of kings and queens. And not only that, I think it's something about the melanin. I think it's something about that being very spiritual people, you know, and in touch with the vibrations of the universe or whatever it is that gives us the special ability to take whatever skill, expertise, or talent to that level, to mm -hmm. a whole other level where no one else can touch it. Yeah. And well, all well, they can well, do is you imitate. know, they try to separate Egypt. Yeah. Yeah, try to say it's not in Africa. Right? Not in Af <laughs> Africa is a continent which uh, constitutes many countries. Mm. And uh, they try to say, but all that, all that the writing, arithmetic, and mathematics, where they're arithmetic. Drawing came from Egypt. It came they from East America. Africa. Absolutely. And even Socrates was the one that says that we, the uh, Greeks, were mere babes in comparison to the yeah. to the Egyptians. They stole the, the culture. Egypt. They stole the culture from the the uh, the uh, uh, what what it was Socrates. They was the uh, from the Greeks. They were the Greeks. And the they Greeks. stole it from the Nubians. From the, Afri from yeah. the Africans. Yeah. Ethiopia, the African. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, and see, and this is the thing that you know me as a history professor here mm -hmm. at Valley is really important for uh, me to pass that information on. Sure. That's kind of like an introduction to history. Mm -hmm. Is for you to understand. First of all, you little black babies here in this classroom, your history did not start in slavery. No, no, Let's get no, that no, straight. No, no, you know, not. your history absolutely did not start in mm -hmm. slavery. In order for you to really fully appreciate history. You're going to have to know who you are, that's, you know, that's and then it's like love, right? You can't love anyone unless you love yourself first. That's right. And you can't love history unless you love, you know, again, that story, your narrative about who your people are. And we are some magnificent people. Yes, everybody knew that but us. Right. Uh, <laughs> so that's one reason why we are harshly treated, a been since we've been here. See, all, most of the other people, immigrants, came to this country from abroad. They came waving at the Statue of Liberty saying, give me your honor, privilege, and so forth. Mm -hmm. We came in the bottom of ships. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, animals, whales, followed from the African coast all the way across. Yeah. Following the slave ships. Because they knew bodies were bodies being, being thrown over and they that, would eat them. Yeah. They followed. In that middle passage. It yeah. still does today. Yeah. You know, the sharks lie yeah. along that yeah. trajectory. So, so, so everybody else. So we have had the roughest kind of life. So if anybody should enjoy America and entitled to all the privilege of America, it ought to be the black man. Absolutely. The black man is the best friend the white man have ever had. And, and he has abused it, but that. he is the best friend. I don't care what you say, he has stuck by Caucasians. And at the same time, Caucasians seem to feel that he's less than them. But there's no inferior or superior race. And, but you, 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 how I say it and how enlightened we are at this time, but there's still, in the back of some people, mind, they feel that it is. Well, I think because they have an inferiority complex. They know our history. They know who and what we are capable of. To your point, we don't. But they do. They have studied us and studied us well. When they went into the great temples of Egypt and into, you know, Timbuktu and even down into Zimbabwe and all of those great libraries and those centers of culture, they saw clearly who we are and what we're capable of. That's why it was their mandate almost to destroy as much of that evidence as possible, and then to re-educate in a, in a way that makes us feel like we are substandard to them and that they created everything. But, you know, that's, that aside, 
Well, when we come back to the Mississippi Delta and we look at the history here and the cotton and understanding that it was those same Africans that came over with the technique and the skill and the seeds of cotton. Cotton is not indigenous to the Mississippi Delta region or to the South at all. Mm -hmm. But we have been planting and chopping and picking cotton since the beginning of time. It is indigenous to Africa. Yeah. And so we knew this thing. And, and then it was because of that skill set that when we came over as enslaved and people. And plus the weather was conducive. To cotton growing, absolutely. Yeah. And still today. And to our culture. And to our, yeah. And so we can handle the weather here in the Delta because that was what we are acclimated and doing. Mm -hmm. and do. So the point is, is that we came with the skills to build this cotton kingdom. And that sweat equity that you referenced early, where we did the work, Grandma Manil, and you included actually, showed up and showed out and made this place a cotton kingdom. And that skill has never been fully recognized or appreciated or given any kind of appreciation and thanks you know, on a national level, when cotton, cotton was the number one industry, the cotton industry was the number one industry in all other industries combined for 200 years. No, all of those industries combined did not equate to the profit of cotton for 200 years. Yeah. That's what the reason we have with the flag, the slave flag, of course, that we had removed it from Greenwood, <laughs> removed it. Yeah. Uh, from City Hall, where I work, and then courthouse moved, so we don't have no rebel flag flying that way. That is, the this, this 11 states that succeeded from the Union was because of, they wanted to keep their slave. Yeah, yeah. No doubts about that. It wasn't because of other laws and things, because they could raise this cotton in the Delta, float it down the Yazoo River to the Mississippi River, bend in New Orleans, and Mm -hmm. Ship it abroad to various countries mm -hmm. to make materials. Primarily Britain and France. Yeah, Britain and France. Right. So this was in this was a money making thing. Absolutely. And this was all free labor. Yeah. Yeah. It was all free labor. So uh, I have white people. Uh, a couple of them said to me, "Well, see, since joined uh, your people sold." I said, well, "That may have been in some cases." I said, "But they sell rat poison." at the corner store in my community, but I don't go down and buy it and eat it. So you could have rejected this. Mm -hmm. You were part of the process. You cannot be excused because you went there for that purpose. For that purpose. And I don't know what all you didn't do or try to sell or swap in order to get black. You knew it was wrong because you had a Bible right in your hand. You're supposed to be, <laughs> uh, you're supposed to know that God created all people equal. Mm -hmm. you, you're supposed to know that. Mm -hmm. you, uh, when you look at a black man, you see a pair of eyes on a normal condition. You see one mouth, you got a pair of ears, mm -hmm. swinging appendages, swinging arms, legs, and walk upright. What? You don't see any cyclone. You don't see an eye here or there. Well, you know, the lips may be different, but that's a benefit. You can carry it too. Nobody can sing like us now because of, of, of these lips. You see what I'm we, we, I don't care what you say. Nobody sings like black folk. I know. Uh, I, I, you're just not going to find that. It's not being prejudiced. It's just being truthful. It's just a fact. And we should not have any kind of shame about being truthful. That's right. You know? So, so uh, all of these factors, and yet you enslave a man, and you sell him like property who hasn't done anything to you. Didn't know this world. You brought him over. I didn't see where you put people in the slave when there's a war on both sides. But African Americans brought to America hadn't done nothing to the white man in America. But yet, he made him a slave. And it took a war to stop that. Over half a million people died in that war. So brothers fought brothers, depending on their location, yeah. in order to keep this commodity. Yeah. That's really what it was. Yeah. Help the economy. That's why the South built mansions and all these other things. It's off of our sweat, blood, and tears. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. But, and the trust funds. Talk about yes, the trust funds. Yes. And I understand the Mississippi State Legislation, um, uh, later, legislators or whatever, 
recently, I think last year, passed a new law to allow people to stockpile money for up to 300 years, much like their great 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 grandfathers had done in the cotton plantation era, yeah. establishing these trust funds to allow you know, the inheritance or the, the kids who are coming in generations, yeah. hundreds of years from now, to have the resources to maintain their their privilege. Yes, that's their objective. But what is God's objective? Just like Obama became president of the United States, I didn't think I'd live to see that. But God had something different in store. Mm -hmm. And now, America can't say they hadn't had a, the son of great, great, great slaves as president of the country or as great, great grandparents was of African American descent. He was an African. Yeah. yeah. So, so all of that. So, you can. Uh, it's uh, kind of like the rich man at the bar. He said, "Well, I got all this stuff now. I don't build all the barns." I got all of this laid up and I'm just going to go back and relax. The Bible says, die food. You will die tonight. I got my cold, you die today. So you, you may be making all that stuff for somebody else. Yeah. Okay. Well, I just know that what is in divine order is for us to, like you said, open our eyes and come back around full circle. You know, we have been at the heights of the heights and the lows of the lows. Yeah. Now we're coming back around. Yeah. The eyes are opening again and saying, yeah. okay. Well, the pendulum swing both ways. Absolutely. So yeah. I think that's what many of the white supremacists are fearful of. And it's also a shame to say that many African people, too, are afraid of change. And afraid of, I guess, the responsibility of change. I don't know. But, but they are not in control. Well, uh, uh, well, well, they, you know, it's kind of like a supervisor. You owe us some stuff, but you can't create anything. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a greater power somewhere that that looks at the process yeah. and make it work. Yeah, that's the greater power we call a God because oh, you had the evidence is there. But you look up and see the sky. You, how did that happen? Yeah. You see the sun 93 million miles away, you know it's got to be a greater power somewhere. And you got a mind. You catalog <laughs> information. If you open up either one of our skulls, all the stuff in my memory, you wouldn't see anything but blood and tissues. But it's something else going on there. You, yeah. you got some memories there that catalog information. Yeah. As you when you got your PhD, you got that some of that stuff catalog and blood and tissue. You open it up, you don't see nothing but blood and tissue. Yeah. But that's not the end of the story. It's memory in that stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that leads me to <laughs> where we are today and how do we harness all of that energy, that power, that spiritual force to accomplish what we will, like Marcus Garvey commanded us to do. Accomplish what you will, my people. You know, just, just what do you will for yourself? What do you want for yourself? How do you now come together and make it happen to our project? Well, it's a process. Mm -hmm. It won't happen tomorrow by noon, but it's going to happen. It is going to happen. It's going to happen, and sometime it happened quicker than it, uh, than we anticipated would. Uh, President Obama, who I would have, somebody bet me a thousand dollars. I bet you a thousand dollars that you're going to not going to have a president. You'll have a black president. I would say, put it up. Because I would took that bet. I, I would take that bet because <laughs> yeah. I didn't think it could happen. Right. But here come a, a person, a brilliant, brilliant person, person come out of yeah. Chicago area, working in the born in Hawaii, yeah, places, right? come in with a new cry and yeah. a new holler. Mm -hmm. Yes, we can. Mm -hmm. And people caught on to it. Mm -hmm. Now he didn't only do four years; he did eight years. And then uh, McCutter, the guy from Pennsylvania, head of the U.S. Senate, said, I'm going to do everything I can to keep old, to defeat Obama. <laughs> like he got defeated himself. He did. And then he got exposed to doing that. Yeah. So, so we, we, we have to do the best we can and leave the rest of it to a greater power. For an example, mm -hmm. if you're 80 years old, your heartbeat 
72 times a minute. I'm a normal condition. Of course, you get frightened. It beats maybe 80 or 90 or 100 times, depending on how frightened you are, how much you have exhausted. You multiply that time 80 years and see what kind of factor, what kind of figure you end up with. Yeah. How, how efficient that is. All of us, including uh, whites, are walking miracles. Now, so how, how, how does that happen? So it's, it's a greater power that controls that process. We call it DNA and RNA. But, but it's a lot going on that we don't see. We don't, we, we, don't, we don't know. We don't have the answer to. So it's just like I'm existing here in this world. But we have a manual to go by to tell us to treat everybody right and try to live right the few years we have on earth. But if you have abused a people, are tempted to enslave a people, and they want us to forget slavery. All that, that was then, but its ramifications are right now. Yeah, it's still with us. And that is on that note that I want to conclude this first part of the session, and then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about all of what's going on here in Mississippi, the Mississippi Delta, the Mississippi uh, Valley State University, and the projects that we're working on here. How do we tie all that in and, and, and build out something you know, that is very appropriate and that speaks to all that history, all that sordid past, and all that divinity that is in place and waiting for us. So we're going to take a quick break and, and come on back with Senator David Jordan. Welcome back to Delta Renaissance on the Road. I'm Dr. Shade Turnipseed, and I'm sitting here with Senator David Jordan, who's also an author of a bestseller, and the name of the book is From the Mississippi Cotton Field to the State Senate. I'm yes. so proud of you. Yes, on cotton fields. <laughs> we have a lot of fields, them. Yes, <laughs> yes, and you're working on the second book now, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, we're working on it. There's uh, so much information. Uh, I've been president of the Voters League for 50 years. This is the 50th year anniversary of my presidency wow. of the Voters League, the Greenwood Voters League. So you'll have an annual banquet? Too. Yeah, each yeah. year I have an annual banquet. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if I'll be able to have a parade and that kind of stuff to celebrate the 50th anniversary. But according to the statistics from uh, uh, some of the stations, that we are the oldest grassroots political organization in the deep south. Congratulations. Point. And you started it. <laughs> started, I'm yeah. really, again, I'm really proud of you. And I yeah. love the opportunity to speak with you right. about this history of the Delta, about civil rights, blues, cotton. I mean, you are a true scholar in that regard. And so let's, let's take each one of those. Because here's the thing. We here at Mississippi Valley State University is working on a major project, again, that you inspired and, and, and um, we've also been kind of just kind of chipping around the edges of it for a while. And it's a great project and it's, it's building a historic site on this very campus, which is in effect, in fact, a cotton field. It used to be a plantation and so now it's a university campus. And you were one of the um, students, 
were you one of the founding students? Or no, you one no of the I was first a second, students? I guess I was a second graduation class in the second graduation class. Okay. The school was 1950. Mm -hmm. I graduated in 1959 uh, from Mississippi Valley here. Okay. Um, Tell us about that, your, your experience here on this campus as a student. Well, as I recall, that was Dr. Lowe who taught us uh, physiology and then Mr. John A. James who taught zoology. And uh, some of those were that I was in the area of science. And then Ms. Ratcliffe, uh, Ratcliffe, she taught uh, uh, Western civilization. And <clears throat> that was Dr. Dr. Reverend David, not Reverend Fred D. Matthews taught social studies. You can remember your <clears throat> professor's yeah, my names. Professors. Those were the ones that made Sixty impact. Sixty something years ago. Yeah. yeah. Those those were the ones that made impact on my in my life. Remember, I was uh, uh, had to get back. <clears throat> excuse me. I was working as a dishwasher at the Holiday Inn in Greenwood. Uh, I when I finished high school, and by the way, Morgan Freeman, I finished the same year. Mm. We graduated the same. And went to school together. Oh yeah, four yeah. years from ninth through twelfth grade. So uh, when I finished college, uh, I had no money. I know that summer we went to Wisconsin and picked peas, and uh, tried to get enough money to enter into college. Mm -hmm. But my brother was a year too old, and I he had been in the army. He told me he's going to help pay my way, mm -hmm. but I had nothing. So on the day I registered, he gave me $10, but it was $44. So I had to drop out two weeks to make the rest of the money so I could stay in. But anyway, I was a dishwasher uh, at uh, Holiday Inn. I'd leave here at 4 o'clock, 3 o'clock, and then I'd flag my way, throw up my thumb, flag to Greenwood. And many times, white people would pick me up, then they new automobiles, and they would, uh, they would see those books. That's why I say, if you're trying to go do something, mm -hmm. somebody, even people may not agree with you totally, will have some kind of compassion. So they, several times, people would pick me up, and they would, I would speak to them. Mm -hmm. You see, you go to Greenwood? I'd say, yes, sir, I'm going to Greenwood. Yeah, there's and a I, lot of good people in this world. Yeah. So and I'd awesome. sit yeah. in the back, yeah. and when I, they wouldn't say a word until we got to Greenwood. They wouldn't say it's a minute time. They wouldn't say anything oh. to me. So when we got to Greenwood, all of the end, I was right on the road. I said, I work here and get up. And I'd say thank you. Sometimes they bow the head and sometimes they just pull on off. That happened any number of times. So when I went there, I would have to stay down until 10 o'clock. I could wash dishes so fast. I had a dishwashing machine. So the first six months, the district managers say, well, David's going to college, so let's make him a salad boy. Make, let him make salads. Mm -hmm. he catch on fast. I think that was the terminology used. So I started making salads. So the next spring, after I worked it one year, he came back again. He said, well, Chef, say, uh, I want you to train, they put him over in the corner and let him make sandwiches. Mm -hmm. And you just handle the meals and he'll make all sandwiches. So I was learning the process then. But were you still going to school? Or yeah, I was still here. Mm -hmm. That's my second year. I'm, I'm a sophomore now. Oh, okay. I'm a sophomore and I'm going the year round because I'm trying to get out of there. So I'll be able to get a job early. So I'm going the year round. And so I would tell him that I said, I'm, I make all the sandwiches. So during the summer uh, days, I would work practically all the time when I was not in school. Mm -hmm. So therefore, one day came, he said, well, Chef, say, uh, you can just fix up the menu for the day. He said, when he come in at 4 o'clock, he can take it on to 10 o'clock. So that meant that I was in charge of the night shift. Ah. So now I'm moving up, and I think they must gave me about four dollars every two weeks. We got paid about four dollars different, so I'm making about thirty-eight dollars every two weeks then. But I was running the evening shift, and uh, 
I would come in sometime. I'd be a little late if I if I didn't have look flat. Oh, usually because some days you so, did have yeah, to walk. Right? Yeah, I didn't walk. I walked a couple of times, mm -hmm. but I didn't walk many times because I'd started off and then somebody would see me and have compassion and pick me up. So I'd get there at four o'clock. What's that about four, five, six miles? Or? It's seven miles. Seven miles. Seven miles. Mm -hmm. But when I got out at 2 o'clock, I had either enough time to walk. So I'd be walking and flagging. So just in case, I'd be at work at 4. So if I got out of here on Tuesday and Thursday at 2 o'clock, then I'd have a chance to walk it yeah. uh, or, or catch a ride. Yeah. So if I caught a ride, it would help me. But if I didn't catch a ride, then I would be close enough to make it by 4 o'clock. So you did that for how many years? I did it for three and a half years. So I started to run in the evening shift, and I had about four young blacks like this. All of us were young. Mm -hmm. I was just a cook. Mm -hmm. So every week or so, we'd have a, get a new dishwasher. Guys just couldn't stand all that fast working and stuff. So a new dishwasher came in and said to the other person, salad maker. I had another boy who was a salad maker. And he had a dishwasher. He had one that cleaned off the table. And he said, that's that tall cook. He fixed me a sandwich. So uh, I said the book. So I said, what kind of something you want, man? I'm just driving around past town. He said, any kind you fix, cook. So I took him uh, some ham, took some cheese, and took some other meats, and made him a good sandwich. You made one of the club sandwiches. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> made him a good one. Yeah. But I made two because I put a Tabasco salt, I put all that hot stuff on that sandwich and had dressed it up real good. I had it hot, I had it hot so uh, to have some fun because I knew it when he bit, when he would take a bite of it, he's going to do something crazy. And I had all that Tabasco sauce, hot sauce and all that on it. Uh -huh. He they put him some french fries on that. Ooh, cook, that sure looked good. So he went and got into a pot. Then he went back in the dish room and start eating. And I heard somebody say, God damn, threw that plate against the wall. I said, what the hell is going to put on this sandwich? So, oh, the hot sauce is too much. Oh, <laughs> so the rest of the guys, the rest of the guys just laughed, laughed. I've done several like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said, uh, Cook, what you put in that sauce? Oh, man, I said, I gave you the wrong one. He has the right one. And he made yeah, I had another one made because I didn't know what the guy was going to do. I had another one made. So uh, uh, I gave him the right one. Mm -hmm. And so from then on, long as he stayed, he always remember what time that cook come in and gave him his hot sandwich. So we we'll always laugh about that. So we created little, little things like that to mm -hmm. pass time, especially when it was slow. Mm -hmm. But I had a lot of uh, fun doing that and cooking. So how did that work with school. I mean, you know, when you think about your load here, how did it impact you as a student? I was, uh, I, I, I got married then. I married my second year in college. I got married. And uh, what it would do, I'd go home at 10 o'clock. My wife was an LPN. She was a nurse. Mm -hmm. And so we got married, got a little house. So I'd come in at 10 o'clock. And I'd be up to Three and four o'clock. Of course, I was taking chemistry. Mm -hmm. I was taking chemistry. You were a science major. Yeah, chemistry major. And um, uh, when that lady got through with my paper, it looked like it had been in combat. It was just red all over uh, because I'd been red all, all over. The yeah, all over <laughs> uh, studying. Yeah. Eleven o'clock at night, Chris put the ch two children to bed. One boy. The first one, then another one came, you know how that goes, and she put mm -hmm. her bed and she'd go to sleep and I'd be in the kitchen. Studying. Studying till 3 or 4 o'clock. Then I got to get up at 5.30, 6 30, I'd be out trying to hitchhike back here in the morning. To get to school on time. Get to school on time, because I didn't have a, enough money to hire to, uh, you know, contract with anybody to, to bring me. No. But sometime out of compassion, yeah. guys who was who were paying a bit stop pick me up right. and they'd give me a good blessing. Now, you're gonna have to pay me. I'm picking your bone books every day. Oh and boy! Yeah, you know, besides, I yeah. deal with that. Starting a shovel service. But I, I, I would get here. 
Now, the students here on this campus, um, there is, as it relates to civil rights, because I do want to tie this into what we're doing with the historic site, and you were a witness to a lot that went on on this campus. And let's first, again, say that this campus was built, you know, with the, the dream and the hope that this would be a service to the community and allow um, local residents to have access to higher education. Yeah, now this was Mississippi Vocational College. Mm -hmm. This was to train blacks how to work and maybe teach, but uh, to trades and so forth. That's what the IHL intended for it to do. Mm -hmm. um, so it was Mississippi Vocational College at that time. And, but they also had teaching as part of it, but uh, shop work was a big uh, big thing going here, major industrial art vehicles on, and, and that kind of stuff, mm -hmm. and lake brick laying and uh, block laying and carpentry, all of these trades was being taught here. Mm -hmm. So it was a vocational college, mm -hmm. but you could get a degree in teaching as well. But the power structure never intended for it to be uh, no more than just that. And so when I so I was, they taught science, so I was a science major. And uh, when I finished, I had a degree in science, mm -hmm. natural science it was, in '59. Mm -hmm. And uh, from then I started teaching. Well, I had to go to the army because I the army had been on reserve to keep me. I had, I was old enough, and I had to go there. And once I finished college, I had to go mm -hmm. to do that duty. But since it was peacetime, they let me out. Once Chris got pregnant with the third child. Your wife, Chris. Yeah, and uh, she was having some problems. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I went before them, and they let me out mm -hmm. since there wasn't no war going on at that time. So I got out on a hardship discharge. That was during the 60s, wasn't it? That was uh, 59. 59. Mm -hmm. Because in the 60s, um, there was some, uh, that was when Greenwood became one of the hot spots for the civil yeah. rights movement. We hadn't gotten to that point. Yeah. Yeah, we're, we're three years ahead of that. Mm -hmm. uh, 59, uh, I guess, the lady from Sunflower County, we have what you call a split session. I don't know, a split mm -hmm. session. We would go to the school. Uh, in July and August, mm -hmm. uh, to chop. To chop cotton. Yeah, we we go to school. Uh, we chop, get out in May and we chop cotton. We lay by cotton. And then we come to school July and August. Okay. Then we out in September to pick cotton to November. So we had uh, seven and two. Seven and two. Yeah, two months in the summer. Oh, okay. And then we start back. In November, we 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 uh, we were out July. We went to school July and August, mm -hmm. and the first of September, September and October, we'd be picking cotton. Okay, then we start back November through May, and get those seven months. Okay. And then have the summer off. Then have uh. uh then now you won't have the summer if you come back in July and August to, to school. Okay. But you had May yeah. and June to chop cotton. Oh, you still work? Okay. So when the, the students had that, yeah. that's, that's where it was in Inverness and that's where it was in Sunflower County. So they would get out in May, May and June and chop cotton. July they would lay it by. Sometimes 10th of July school start. It goes to the 10th of September. And, and then they're out the rest of September up to November, picking cotton. Just for the sake of picking yeah. cotton. Yeah. This That's, is truly the, the cotton kingdom well, well, there, because everything centered well, on cotton. What it was, it was the, uh, uh, the board uh, control, the plantation system control the schools for African-American. Now in Greenwood, they didn't have that. They started in September and went straight through. But in the town like in the Nola, the farmers controlled the school district. So they gave nine months, but they split it so that you could harvest cotton September and October, so that you could chop cotton uh, May and June, 
So you'd be in school July and August when it was very hot during that time. You know, didn't have air conditioning. They had only fans. Yeah. So, but we still got nine months. Then some schools just had eight months period. Yeah. Um, till later, the whole school system everywhere went to nine months. Mm -hmm. So I was I was hiding in the NOLA on the split session. You know that whole education and cotton thing um, really needs deeper study. You know, and so that people could appreciate and understand what happened. You know, what happened to black people in throughout the South, really, but. It was always centered around the agricultural, you know, yes. harvesting. And, and, and not only that, we never get, very few times we got new books. Yeah. When the superintendent, when new books would come in from the state, he'd ask the principal to come over to the schools with a truck and pick up the old books for the black students. And the white students got the new books. Right. So sometimes students had books already had three or four names in it. Sure. And scratches and pages yeah. missing and yeah. all that sort of stuff. Yeah, but that but it's amazing thing happened with that, the dark uh, Black people got in the back in the dark, and they read those books and they learned from them, even though there may be some missing pages. So when integration came, we were not behind based on what we had been exposed to. And then you had teachers who cared about you. Teachers who cared. Who filled in the blanks, right? That's right. And who filled in those missing pages. That's right. And who made sure that you were, you felt love anyway. Because yeah. they knew that looking at the conditions of the educational system and the discrepancies of the disparity between the two, they had to compensate and overcompensate. Well, that, that, that is correct. Now, uh, and they would tell you, they knew your ability, and they'd tell you, boy, you're going to, Major this, I'm gonna talk to your folks. Right. I'm gonna talk to your folks. You and then what happened when, when integration came in, counselors, most of those black teachers lost their positions, right? Yes. You had something you call a gene supervisor. That was a superintendent for black schools. You'd mm -hmm. come around and look at what the black schools needed and under certain circumstances mm -hmm. you'd get some things done. She worked with the board and the, and the real superintendent. And a lot of those principals or those gene super, Supervisor. supervisors were instructed to do specific things and oh, are course. discouraged certain um, disciplines and our um, uh, career choices and, you know, to kind of steer you into vocation or mm -hmm. to steer you into labor. Not It was not to create leaders. It well, was, not designed to instill in you the, the, the system the control, right? The plantation system, the cotton belt controlled everything in the South, reference to Afro Americans. They control the principals, yeah. they control, or the superintendent was the one that controlled the principals. Yeah. Because in a certain place, I know my sister got fired because she asked some questions. That's in another county. Yeah. So when I first contract I signed, I had to tell, say, well, I was a member of the NACP. That was a question on your, on your contract. Are you a member of the NACP? You had to say no. You said yes. Had to say no. If you say yes, you wouldn't get the job. You wouldn't get the job. Nothing the principal could do. I don't care how bad he wants you. You know, and then that goes, that leads into my next question about that student protest during the SNCC era. And, and during the uh, civil rights era here in the Delta, again, where Greenville, where Bob Moses and all those guys came in. Well, what, what, what and happened? And what happened on this campus and Dr. White's uh, response to it? Well, in 66, we just had the 50th anniversary of the Meredith March. In 66, Jane Meredith was going to march from Memphis to Jackson on 51. He made it for Hernando, and a man shot him down. Mm -hmm. Hernando, I believe, Hernando. Then, Jane Meredith was out of the, could not lead the, the march. Dick Gregory came along and led, and Floyd McKissick from CORE, then Snick, all of them, Stokely Carmack, everybody picked up, and then, uh, SCLC, Dr. King, 
-hmm. group came and all four of these organizations came on and continued to march. Mm -hmm. Well, it took, that was 66, it took uh, about a month and a half from Memphis to Jackson. But when they got to, to walk. Really. Yeah, yeah, they were walking. When they got to Winona, they wanted to come over to Greenwood. Now, this 66. Now, Greenwood hot spot was in 63 because of the cotton pickle automation change. We didn't talk about that. But they swung over to Greenwood to take a bath. And, uh, they wanted to know if they could come to this campus yeah. to, uh, to uh, Duck King and others to take a bath or rest. And the boy, IHL, said no. IHL out of Jackson. Yeah, the Institution of Higher Learning said no. He took Dr. White, don't lie on the campus. And he was the president of the yeah, Dr. J.H. White was the president, mm -hmm. which had no choice. Right. And he didn't allow them, so students here got, ups got upset and they started marching as well. Ada Bina to here to Ada Bina. And then they closed the school for uh, six weeks. And then uh, President White uh, met with Mr. Lewis Gold and myself. I was young, I was, I was uh, 60, yeah, 60. I was head of the voters there, about 66, somewhere, 65, 66. And we met in President White's office over there. And uh, the senator at that time was named Senator Corker Lee Patrick, who owned the plantation up at Slaughter area. He was a senator, and we had him in the meeting, myself, Bishop, Mr. Bishop, Dr. White, and uh, Senator Patrick. Mm -hmm. And Dr. White said that he had lost uh, $900,000 that whole uh, six weeks a month, the school lost $900,000. That's what it cost them to shut the doors for that long. And he wanted the IHL would not give him that money, that $900,000. He shut it down because the students were protesting? The students, yeah. The board lunch. ordered them to. Yeah. Uh, the board ordered Dr. White to shut down the university. Yeah. And what comes next is really, really interesting. And we're going to take a break. Uh, okay. And then we're going to come back because okay. what comes next, the response to that protest, is historic. Okay. And so we'll be right back with Senator David Jordan here on Delta Press. Welcome back to Delta Renaissance on the Road with Senator David Jordan. I'm Dr. Shonda Turnipsey, and we're having a great conversation about the life and times of Senator David Jordan. Uh, and he, the author of this best selling book, From the Mississippi Cotton Fields to the States, and, 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 and more books to come. But here on Valley's campus, he has the distinct privilege to have been on the front lines of, of so many things that happened. And one of them was that whole civil rights movement that happened on this campus uh, where students um, decided to stand in support of, of the James Meredith um, March, March. Uh, of 1966. Mm -hmm. And then the repercussions of... Oh, okay. Now, as a result, as I said, 
when they got to Winona, walking on 51 from Memphis, when they got to Winona, they wanted to come over to Greenwood because 63, Greenwood already had a history of 1963. So this is 66. So Stoker Carmichael, Bob Moses, and uh, uh, Willie Peacock, and Sam Block, and all that period. Mm -hmm. And Lance Giach, who is deceased now. Mm -hmm. All of them were familiar with Greenwood, who was part of this march as well. Mm -hmm. And they were, they was, Snick was already had office here. So they wanted to come, Dr. King, and wanted to swing over to Greenwood to spend the night and take a shower and they asked to use the school. And uh, the, uh, and some of the students wanted to be involved in some of sure. Yeah. And so uh, he checked with IHL. The president. Yeah. Dr. White checked with the institution how I learned, the college board, as mm -hmm. constantly called. And they told him, no, don't want him on campus. Certainly not. Didn't want Dr. Martin Luther King on campus. No, didn't want Dr. Martin Luther King on campus, period. And they insist they, insist they they shut the campus down, and the students here got in an uproar. Then they started marching from right here to Ada Bina, and they left, and then they had them, some of them, sent to Parcher, and that, that messed the whole system up because my good friend Charles Evers came in uh, uh, at that time because mm -hmm. Mego, let's see, that was 66. Mego had been killed three years of 66. Uh, and so it was a big uproar. And it shut the school down for five weeks, I think, five weeks. And it was about 900 students or so yeah. that were sent to parchment yeah. for protesting. Yeah, protesting. And they, they were, actually stayed in parchment prison. Well, they for a day or two. They yeah, didn't yeah. stay. They, some of them stayed a little long, but they didn't yeah. stay long. People were out and they let them out. Yeah. But the bottom line was that it created the problem. Yeah. Their absence from here cost this school $900,000. And the meeting that uh, Dr. White, I was head of the young graduate at that time, and I was head of the Lotus League then. That was 66, yeah, I was head of it. So he called, he wanted to meet with some black leaders. So he got uh, Lewis Golden, who was a barber who used to cut Dr. White's hair. Mr. W.J. Bishop, at that time, he was over the State Elks. And, uh, Represented Robert G. Bunke Huggins, that no, Senator Corporal Lee Patrick at that time. He was our senator. Mm -hmm. And so he needed $900,000 to get everything back in order. So IGL would give it to him. So Senator Patrick says, if you come before the legislature, you and Mama White come before the legislature, I'd get you that 900000 And Dr. White did that based on what uh, Senator Patrick told him. Mm -hmm. And that two or three days later in the 6 o'clock news, Chris and I and were watching Mama White and Dr. White speaking to the House of Representatives in the Mississippi legislature mm -hmm. requesting $900,000. And after that speech, he, Dr. White had a strong friend who was the Speaker of the House named Buddy Newman. Mm -hmm. Whatever Dr. White needed, Buddy Newman would get it for him. And so he went to Buddy. Buddy Newman told him to come before, agreed with Patrick, who came before the House, mm -hmm. Speaker of the House, would give him the $900,000. Mm -hmm. And they gave it to him. They did give it to him. Yeah. But the next month, President White was fine. I jail fighting. I jail for going to the state. Yeah, bypassing I jail because they weren't going to give it to him. They weren't going to give it to him. <laughs> but he, but the idea, he yeah. bypassed him. Right. He probably could have stayed and they uh, uh, sacrificed something else to revive, but they didn't give it to him. He bypassed and got it from the legislature. Right. So he broke rank. It wasn't the order of protocol. I mean, but then they had already set precedents in having him shut down the school in the first place. Yeah. And, you know, already. But you have to understand, when he did that, he, according to the standard and the system, he was supposed to have gone and shut up and not try to get it anywhere else and just wait that other uh, period out. And, yeah. Okay? And hope and pray that they would open it back up. But he had some alternative because of Buddy Newman. 
well, Speaker, the Speaker of the House, yeah. Speaker Buddy Newman, and Senator Corporal Lee Patrick. Okay. They met with Buddy, Buddy Newman, and Buddy Newman apparently told him, and Cor Patrick told him, if he and Mama White would come before the House of Representatives right. in the Mississippi legislature, they would provide that money for him. So it ended up being where he saved the university in the end. He, he yeah. saved it from being shut down. Well, well even yeah. Even though it was tarnished along the it, way. Even though it cost him his job. It cost him his job and it yeah. cost the students time in parchment, you know. So there yeah. was... Well, the, it, the, the parchment situation mm -hmm. was not the big issue. It was bad that students went, but they didn't stay no very long time. But the idea of sending college students to parchment who was here for an education because if they rebelled the way that the the school was being treated. Sure. Then they had law enforcement send them to pardon as though they was hard criminals. For standing on principle. Yeah, yeah. Right. So uh, yeah. that was that's what brought civil rights workers in, like Charles yeah. Ellis and many others, yeah. Benjamin Hook out of Memphis. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. All, all those people right. came in. And uh, well they did the same thing for all colonies as well. It closed. All, all corn had similar problems, yeah. but this was a major problem here for Mississippi Valley. I don't think they may have closed all corn for a while, but I know they closed Valley. Mm -hmm. All right, from that point, they fired Dr. White. He came over and talked to him. He was highly disappointed. It, it, it broke his heart because he had built this building called a Million Friends. Mm -hmm. He was going to raise a million dollars. Have to be retired over in this building. After is, they is the building it, still standing? Yeah, it's it's right next to the uh, administration building. Uh, come out of the administration building and turn turn left and come back this way. Mm -hmm. Then that building used to be the uh, build, uh, building of a million friends. Oh, the Friends okay. Building. Okay. Dr. White was going to raise a million dollars for that, and Buddy knew it was going to happen. But after they fired him, he wanted to stay on to do just that. They wouldn't allow him. And they uh, also uh, appointed a uh, uh, person from Alcorn, second president of Mississippi Valley, Borkins, Ernest A. Borkins was a president from Alcorn. He was a graduate of Alcorn who taught biology there. They brought him up as president of Mississippi Valley State University. Mm -hmm. And Dr. White asked to stay on to do that. But uh, they, wouldn't allow it. they wouldn't allow it. And then uh, Valley wasn't the university then. Then a bill came to the legislature to name certain school universities. And so, and the request Patrick, Senator Patrick was a powerful senator. He wanted Valley to be named the university. So that's how all eight institutions of higher learning was made universities because uh, they wanted certain ones named. Could have been, I don't know if it's Delta State or not, but they wanted some of their name. And then Senator Patrick thought, if you're going to name state, uh, could have been Delta State, I'm not sure. You're going to name a school, another school in the Delta University, and the Valley's going to have to remain a college. That's going to take students away from yeah. from Valley because something about a university, people seem to sure. say, it, it gives you more prestige. more prestige. yeah. So we end up at eight <laughs> universities. That's how we end up at eight universities. Well, Senator Patrick was a true friend. A true friend, yeah. A true friend, uh, in fact, um, he was the first senator to take blacks to the legislature as page. Wow. And my, one of my sons, the one that is the pharmacist now and they're the heavy mm -hmm. the, the big guy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the he doctor, is, the big guy. Yeah, yeah. He is the one that yeah. uh, he and another person were the first two black pages, pages the, uh, that Senator house. Patrick carried from the Mississippi Delta to the Senate. Certainly from the County. That. And they uh, he didn't win the next time. He lost because of that. The retaliation yeah. and this closed society that yeah. we live yeah. here in Mississippi. Because the reason I know it, because uh, the guy was running against me, brought yeah. the newspaper. All this came out of the newspaper. He said, uh, Mr. Jordan, is this your son? He's running against Patrick. I said, yeah, that's my son. What's, 
and I got a little serious, but it was in my home where he came and asked me that. Mm -hmm. And I didn't ask him to leave, but I got a little serious because I didn't figure it was his business. Mm -hmm. I knew where he was coming. I said, well, this, is this your son? I said, yes. And I uh, see him. He was with Governor Bill Waller and Senator Patrick. And the, these two black boys were with him. And uh, as a result, that was front page story. I got a copy of it at home. Oh my God! And so they used that against him sure. to say that oh, he's a he's an end lover. Huh? He broke the rules. Yeah, he, and the rules were yeah. you keep yeah black folks in their place. Yeah. Some Patrick never did say it, but that's <laughs> yeah. what got him. To we feel. know the history. Mm -hmm. So now, given all of that, give me, if you could, in your own words, justification for building an interpretive site here, a, a historic site here, in a you know, like bringing in statues, bringing in historic markers, and, and re retrofitting a building so that it's like a museum, but it's, it's, a, it's a historic site that speaks to this history that we've been talking about for the past hour, and really lets the students understand, again, the significance of, of Valley's history, of Mississippi Delta's history, and of their history as people who have contributed so much and have gotten so little in return. Tell us and give us, if you could, just a justification for establishing a center on this campus. Like well, it's, it should be a statue of Dr. White on this campus, mm. really, and uh, also probably Dr. Lowe and, and, and a few others, based on what they had to go through with. Mm. Uh, I was told, this was told to me, that the IGL would never see them along with the whites who ran the colleges that time. They would always have to be last, make them last. And Dr. White was the kind of person, he was a good negotiator, very likable person. Uh, and uh, he was able to build friends with people like, powerful people like Buddy Newman. Uh, Speaker of the House at that time, mm -hmm. and they were able to keep Valley going. And there were times when Valley did not have a stadium, mm -hmm. adequate stadium, mm -hmm. and uh, from the political perspective, the Voters League pushed the governor, who was a friend of the Voters League, who was Bill Wallace, who would do it because Bill Waller, governor can only serve four years, Bill Waller was, uh, was uh, aiming to become a U.S. Senator. And he knew that he could carry this county without endorsement. Mm -hmm. And so he was the first governor to attend the Voters League. Mm -hmm. And he will, became a friend of the Voters League. Of your organization. Of my you organization. Yeah. So his son came with him, who is the Chief Justice right now. So I had him down three years ago and gave a post-human award to this governor when Governor Waller di died, mm -hmm. uh, saying that he was the first to come to Voters League and uh, the things that he did for this college. In fact, the first, we just honored uh, Harrison. We were the first, according to Governor Waller, to get the first black on the college board. And that was done because Governor Wallace said he wanted to do something for Valley because of the voters' league. Mm -hmm. So what we did, we got with Ernest A. Barkin, who was president, this was about 73, 74. Dr. Ernest A. Barkin, who was president at that time, represented Huggin, myself, Bishop, and Golden, and we met in a patrol station because Representative Huggins, who's a white person, who the governor had said, get with uh, David Jordan, and I want to point a black to the college board mm -hmm. and get with the president and see who they want. Mm -hmm. So we called uh, Huggins and said, well, we're going to meet. I said, where are we going to meet? We Huggins, son, Representative Huggins said, we're going to meet in the patrol station. So we've got Dr. Bork and all of the five of us met in the patrol station. Where is the patrol station? In Greenwood. Oh, okay. Yeah, at that time. It's mm -hmm. still in Greenwood. Okay. Not in the same place. 
So we met in there, we asked Dr. Bork and who he want, Dr. Bork and said, now wait a minute, gentlemen, y'all gonna get, get me fired. I'm not supposed to be trying to win this, y'all gonna get me fired, so you got to work. I said, well, just tell me who you want. And uh, we all were sitting there and he said, well, I didn't say that y'all got to keep it confidential. He said, I want Doc Harrison, he has a city. To do? To become the first black on the college board. That's why that building is Harrison Building. Got what it. we just dedicated last week. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So that's how he got to be on there. Okay. Yeah. So now we got the first black on the college board. Right. And Harrison didn't know me, but he came to the Voters League. Dr. Borkin had me come to thank us for it. Mm -hmm. But we became a close friend and a good friend of Governor uh, Bill Wallace right. because he had done something extraordinary, what turned us towards him. He had done something extraordinary. He had tried to persecute Beckworth, who had killed Meg Ellis, mm -hmm. who was from this town. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I got that in the book that I knew as a boy. You do this man. Yeah. Oh, okay. yes. Yes, it came from the right son, yeah. yeah. So uh, the governor, uh, as a county, pro as a prosecutor, an attorney, uh, 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 Bill Waller tried Made to put him away to put, at that, that time. That's good. Now, in terms of statues and, and Now, as far as Mississippi Valley, we have always felt that it should be an oasis. I always use that term. Mm -hmm. It's in the heart of the Mississippi Delta. Mm -hmm. It is the, before integration, it was the only place that African American could go that had no money. Mm -hmm. And because very few could go to Oakland or Jackson State. So here was a university, a vocational college, right in the heart of the Delta. The Delta, right. That would serve people like myself who didn't have resources or money to go to Jackson State. Right. And so we wanted to make it a great university, make it a great college. So we fought to keep it here against great odds. Now, Dr. White, I don't care what you say about it, Dr. White had to be a tough man, to, a negotiating person, in order to endure what the Citizen Council was doing and what all of the, uh, the atmosphere at that time right. was. So yeah. he is to be yeah. admired. Yeah. Yeah. He was not a weak man, right. but the circumstances against him were much different. Yeah. And so the optics on it is something, again, that's really strange. And we do need to interpret it. We need to tell our own stories. And we need to celebrate those who fought that fight for it's us. Fought that uh, fight. And, 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 and uh, as far as the music, B.B. King yeah. was born in Lee Floor County, right down to my eyes. You'll see a little mm -hmm. sign that said Burklair. Mm -hmm. When you go into Bur Burklair, it's nothing but a community. So since this B.B. King, I know you got a museum in, in the NOLA, mm -hmm. but it wouldn't be a museum in, in the NOLA had he not been born in Lee Floor County. Yeah, in Burklair. So, uh, yeah, yeah. so this has no effect on what in the NOLA does. But if we put a shandy, a three-room shack, the way black people lived and how B.B. King, what he lived and what he was born, because all most blacks lived in three rooms, what we call shotgun houses. Mm -hmm. I understand that style came from Africa. It did. And you could look right through the front, all the way through the house. It sure did. That yeah. architectural style yeah. was that. Architectural style. So he's born in a shandy of that type. Mm -hmm. What would happen, uh, Dr. Tennessee, if you had a replica of that home yeah. on this campus, yeah. since he was born in this county, since he was born three miles from this campus, campus wasn't there then, but it's here now, mm -hmm. and said this is the home, that kind of house B.B. King mm -hmm. was born in, mm -hmm. and put it as a museum on this campus, I love and it. as tourists come to Greenwood, I lecture to different, I had different tourists come to Greenwood. They could know, I'd have a sign put up on this road, the home that B.B. King was born in, or the house, probably house. And you could do that. And I could do that yeah. on the highway. And people who come through here, tourists, 
no one be decaying history or they could come from in the Nola and say here, yeah. to Greenwood sure. on Valley Campus at the Shindy or the house that B.B. King was born in, go by to see it. And you could have a little hors d'oeuvres, little stuff there, and you'd have a little museum in the county where he's born, two miles from where this type of house were. I love it. And and you got my full commitment on that. Yeah. I want to see it happen. I want to see it happen because had this not been, this was some major university, that would be done. What do you think of Edward Preston was born in the Lafayette County? Yeah. Do you think of University of Mississippi would not have right. a replica? They'd probably have a statue there. And everything else that goes along with And all the only thing we're asking for is a shindy, right. Right. showing how this humble man came up. So we're looking for some people to donate a shotgun house to us so that we can restore it. I, 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 don't, I can't so many of them. There's still a lot of them around. There are. That may be somebody would donate it. Mm -hmm. I, I, if I'm not mistaken, somebody told me that they would donate it. Well, we uh, I, I, I'll have to find. But if okay. we decide to do it, we'll get the shanty. I think it's, a, it's pretty close to a done deal. The president has agreed to allow us to bring the statue on campus and to do something and to honor the cotton legacy and, and, and everybody knows what grew out of the cotton fields were the blues, mm -hmm. spirituals mm -hmm. and all of that civil rights and black power movement again grew out of the cotton field and culture as we know it mm -hmm. today all over the world stems from our experiences you know, and all of those things that we had to do to save ourselves. And I see blues and spirituals mm -hmm. as survival music. Mm -hmm. And well, that's yes. why it resonates so well with everybody. Well, that's yeah. right. Now, if so, you come out, coming out of Greenwood, you see a big sign say, will it be white? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Take another look at it. You look at it now, mm -hmm. it looks good. But I, it cost me uh, $1,000 out of my pocket to get this project started. Then when I got started, then other people contributed. Cost okay. about five thousand dollars to get that, and now you got a uh, uh, person who the first time went to Olympic five times mm -hmm. from Greenwood, Mississippi. Yeah, yeah. That's why I, I on David Jordan apartment, I had the place there along with other people, along with the school. They got everything on the board, uh -huh. but the idea of pushing that yeah. made it become a reality. So that's what we're going to push, and that's what this, uh, this segment is about. It's about really documenting the story, getting that narrative, getting the justification for establishing such a site here on this campus. Then if we don't do it, who? who? Ain't nobody going to do it. No, it's so that's going to be, it's up, it's up to us. And so that's why I'm going to make the call for everybody and anybody who's listening to that to please make any kind of contribution you can to see this thing become real on the Mississippi Valley State Campus. We must, must, must build a historic site and tribute to I don't think I, all of I, these people that you're IHL talking. would have any problems, so I need, we need to know. Uh, well, our president agrees with Agrees with the So what we need to do now is just get the shandy mm -hmm. and, and paint it up mm -hmm. and fix it up. And get whatever funding it is yeah. required to do all of that. Yeah. And then put it in that building that um, we, we have a particular building that we're looking at. It's the oldest building on campus. And have that. Now you're going to put it in the building? No, no, it'd be just outside. Yeah, yeah. I want so that chance to see just it. outside. Yeah, you'll so, be able to see it. I'm going to take yeah. it over there so you can see it. Okay. But, um, but the, Senator, it has been such a pleasure once again to sit with you and to have this conversation. And we're going to keep doing it. We're going to revisit this conversation over and over and over again. And I just love it that you take the time out to, to share with us so much. And well, it's information that you hold. But well, I was born in this county. Yeah. And uh, I've had problems in this county uh, for the sake of African Americans. And, uh, but God has blessed me in this county. And I'm and I'm proud uh, of, of being Liberal County. Now, one final thing before I go: when I finish Valley State and want to go to graduate school, Ole Miss would not accept me. 
because they were not accepting this uh, students from Valley. That was well, when, at the time, the Russian put the Sputnik up by my being yeah. a science major, and that's Science Foundation. So I'd offer scholarship to all science teachers. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I got, I had to go out of state. Yeah. Uh, Kansas State College of Pittsburgh. Then I ended up getting a sea culture program leading to a master's degree in chemistry from the University of Wyoming. That's how I ended up way out there. And so we can attribute it to your valley education that you have become such a success in life. So thank you, sir. To my maladjustment. <laughs> Thank you, thank you so much. Well, uh, it, it's not, it, it is significant, and let's get that done really in the memories of, of Dallas State University. Really we still going to make this universe an oasis. It is an oasis. It yeah. is already. We have claimed that. You bet. So, this is Dr. Trevor C. signing off, and I want to thank you all for joining us here on Dr. Renaissance, and I'll see you next week. Okay. All right, let me get to town. i got some work I need to get done. Yeah. Uh, Oh, 